Yeah, it's going to be a good morning, huh? <laughs> good morning and welcome to Zion, those of you who are here and those of you who are with us online. So glad that you're here this morning and a happy, happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. Today is the sixth Sunday of Easter, so we stay in the Easter season. And today we are looking at what does it mean to be people who live acclaimed. And we will hear Jesus' words to the disciples right before he is arrested. And we will make a connection to how that might matter for our life this coming week. At Zion, you know that we love to celebrate our youth, and on Sunday, June 4th, we will be celebrating our high school seniors. After all, what a great accomplishment, and their church family should be part of that celebration. So if you know someone in that high school category, let them know at the 1030 service on June 4th. We want them here, and we want to celebrate. If you know that uh, you are one of those folks and you can be with us, stop by the information desk today and let us know that you will be coming. We want to celebrate with you. So speaking of celebrating youth, I have to tell you what went on here on Wednesday night. First of all, our new associate pastor call committee met with the associate with the bishop in Minneapolis Synod. And so that is exciting to get that process rolling. Grateful for those folks who have said yes to that call. We will install them and pray for them next week. But that meant that the assistant to the bishop was coming. And as he walked in through the doors, first of all, he heard this loud music blaring all around the building. And then he saw over 106 7th and 8th graders on a mission project right here in their own church. They were, it was called Mission Clean the House, Clean God's House. And it just, I have to tell you how amazing it was. And the best words to do that, I'm going to just share what our youth directors wrote on Facebook. Proud does not even feel like a strong enough word. We had to stop ourselves from getting emotional a few times during our confirmation service project. Guess how many teens complained about this project? Zero. Guess how many teens refused to participate or hid away? Zero. Guess how many, or excuse me, and guess how many teens were grumpy while they were cleaning? Zero. And guess how much glass cleaner was used? <laughs> well, the answer to that is way more than zero. Some of the windows <laughs> got really, really washed. We heard one of our guides say, maybe a little less product. I mean, you know, they were drawing smiley faces. Why wouldn't you? The, bring some joy. So one of the guides said, uh, a little less product, product and a little more elbow grease, to which the teen replied with, what is elbow grease? Oh, how we love our Zion family. And that is exactly the way Wednesday night felt. It just was wonderful to see our 6th, 7th, and 8th graders say, this is our place and we want to take care of it. And then just watch them have so much fun with one another as they did that. They also cleaned out the courtyard. Uh, so I want to say thank you. Thank you to our 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. Will you help me thank them? Thank you, thank you. And also, I think that is really, really brave youth directors. <laughs> Say, hey, let's try this as a, youth, as a project. So thank you to them as well. Those are my announcements for this morning. I am going to invite you to stand up and share the peace with one another. Good morning. Peace be with you. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day.
there. How's everybody doing today? Awesome. What a great, what a great morning it's been. You guys, that was beautiful. I hope all the mothers are having a great day. Great to see you all today. Look at all these kiddos. We are on our very last day of Sunday school. That's always so bittersweet. So bittersweet. But you're all here today. We're going to make it the best day ever. Best day ever. So for those of you that might not know me, I'm Kristen Lothammer, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Children's Family Ministry Program here. And we have Christy Wagner over here. She's another co-director. And then we have Emily Comstock, who is the Children's Family Ministry Coordinator. So great to see you all today. Okay, boys and girls. Good job, you guys. Happy Mother's Day, you guys. Um, another thing I would like to show you today is I would like to have all, well, this is most of our Sunday school teachers and shepherds for 1030. I'm going to have you stand up, teachers and shepherds. Um, congregation, these people right here is why Sunday school happens. Every Sunday, these people show up. Thank you. We're missing a couple, um, but you guys, thank you so much. This program would not be what it is without you. So thank you for doing the most important thing we can do, and that's to teach the word of God to these children, and then they can go and do and be awesome people just like you. So thank you so much, you guys. Um, boys and girls, I would love for us to stand up today. We have a Zion Kids mission here that the kids come over to Trinity Hall, and they say it every Sunday when they're here. We're going to go ahead and stand up, boys and girls, and we're going to teach the congregation what our Zion Kids mission is all about, what we want to do when we leave church and when we're in church. So you guys remember it. We're going to do it just like we do in large group over there, okay? All right. So when we go over there, we say, welcome to Zion Kids. Where we know, invite, do, and strengthen. Oh, my goodness. Good job, you guys. That's what we do at Zion Kids. Way to go. Way to go. You can have a seat. Thank you for sharing that, you guys. You keep doing that stuff, okay? All right, and then I have um, Christy, who would love to tell, or Emily, who would love to tell a little bit about Vacation Bible School. All right, so good, um, good morning, everyone. Like Chris, um, Kristen said, my name is Emily, and um, we are actually getting ready right now for Vacation Bible School. And Vacation Bible School happens the first week after school gets out. And so we um, encourage um, all of you to sign up your kids for Vacation Bible School. The theme this year is... Um, Stellar VBS, um, Shine Like Jesus, it's an outer space theme, and it's going to be uh, lots of fun, so we encourage all of you to sign your kids up. And I'm Christy, nice to meet you all. Um, I'll, I'm here to talk about volunteers, and you know, since you're signing your children up for VBS, this would be a great opportunity to sign yourself up to help as a volunteer. We need volunteers to help VBS run really smoothly. Um, so consider signing up. We do have some work nights coming up if you'd like to just come and help us decorate and make the church look really you know, spaceshipy in the outer space, that'd be really, really fun too. Um, and the donation board, um, we added a few things to our donation board today. So if you'd like to take a look at that, it'd be wonderful if you could help us out with a donation if you feel so inclined to do that as well. Thank you very much. And now we're going to pray, and then we're going to go play. All right, so let's go ahead, and we're going to learn, learn, learn some more fun today. All right, so you guys repeat after me, and we'll have the congregation join us, okay? All right, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. You, are you are good and wise. I will praise you when I rise. I when I rise. Jesus, Jesus, hear this prayer I send. 
Bless my family and my friends. Help my feet to go in the way you show. Help my hands to do all things loving, kind, and true. All things loving, kind, and true. And all God's children said, Awesome. Preschool. Your teachers are already down here, but if you're in preschool, you can go this way with your teachers. There you go. We got preschoolers coming. There we go. Couple, maybe. And the rest will go. Well, we're gonna well, we're gonna go this way. Okay. So let's walk, walk, walk. Oh boy. Oh boy. Here we go. We gotta brace myself for this. The first reading, a reading from Acts. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead the word of the lord thanks be to god the second reading is a reading from first peter who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet. Do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Thank you. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be within you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to please be seated. Being claimed, living claimed. If it is something that you can grab onto, and carry with you this week, I can guarantee you that whatever comes your way, you will have a different kind of peace. Last week, we talked about the voice of God and how God calls each one of us to a purpose in our lives. We talked about how collectively we work at hearing the God's voice We talked about little baby Hope and her cries in the middle of the night and how we help answer God's call to make sure that children are safe and loved collectively as we share our resources with others. And then we heard this incredible news from 1 Peter. This is uh, in between a reading that is a long reading telling about how we are once lived and how we are to now live. So these two verses, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. We might kind of gloss over that. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people, meaning God, the creator of all that is, all that has ever been. You are his. So this reading from John's gospel this morning takes place on the night that Jesus is arrested, so soon to go to the cross. And he is gathered there with the disciples, and he has many important things to tell them. And he is telling them about the gift of another advocate, the Holy Spirit, who will be with them. And in the middle of this conversation, we read a small sentence that says, I will not leave you orphaned. That's another one that we might just gloss right over. But if you can imagine that night, those friends gathered around, the things that Jesus told them would have to happen in the next days. You can almost imagine Jesus willing them and and begging them to believe his promise. You can almost see tears in his eyes as he said, listen guys, I am not going to leave you orphaned. It was important information for them, especially for the days that were ahead, for them to know that they would not do that alone. 
So along with that promise that Jesus gives to the disciples and to us, and that reading from 1 Peter, those two pieces are reasons that we as Christians are bold to say we are claimed. We are claimed by God who made a decision. There's a little book that is called um, Free. It's just called Free. And we used it way, way, way back when I was a seventh grader in confirmation. And it's written by two of Lutheran's most stellar theologians, uh, Gerhard Frost, or excuse me, Gerhard Ferdy and James Nestigan. And this is what they say about being claimed. God is the one who has made the decision. God has not waited to find out how sincere you are. God has not waited to find out how religious you are or how well you understand the Bible. God hasn't even waited to find out how interested you are or willing to take on his decision for you. God has simply decided it. You are his. God made this decision, this claim on your life, fully knowing, full well knowing what kind of person you are. He did not wait to see if you were worthy. He, by his claim, made you worthy. God knows where you're strong and where you're weak, what you are most proud of, and those things that you would just as soon hide. And still, God's decision is made. I claim you. So right about now, what we used to call way back in confirmation, what we used to call the old Adam or the old Eve should be kind of percolating up in you. When I tell you over and over and over you're claimed, there's a part of you that probably says, wait a minute, I have no intention of being claimed because claimed seems an awful light, lot like being possessed or being someone else's and, you know, we do it our way, right? We're independent. We don't need anybody's claim on our life. That's the old sinful part of us that shows up. We sort of push away from that. It's like, it is truly like the teenager who is learning that independence and pushing the boundaries, kind of saying, you know, mom, dad, drop me off half a block down that way or certainly don't come into the mall with me, with my friends, you know, stay a little bit. We kind of do that to God. But still, he makes this decision to claim us. And really, if you really think about what that means, we should all be asking, what in the world have we done to deserve that kind of claim on our lives, that kind of love? Being claimed by God means, for example, in this coming week, when you do something or you don't do something, and you're sure you have messed up big time this time, you still are claimed. You still are God's child. You are somebody. In those times this coming week when you feel uncertain about the future, you are claimed. And in those times when you find yourself being stuck in the past and holding on to those things that you have done, you are still claimed. The list could go on, but the answer is the same. Because of Jesus, your past, your uncertainties, and all the ways that you are certain you do not measure up, they don't matter. We put so much stock into that, but that's not what matters. What matters is that you are somebody because God said so. So what does that look like? in this world that would rather hear you say, I did it my way, I'm all independent, I don't need anyone. How does that look? Well, there are two things about this decision. Oh, did I go backwards? There we go. There are two uh, things that we need to know about this decision. 
that God has made. And these are things you already know. We are claimed by a God who loves us unconditionally. You've heard that before. But here's the thing about that. If we are truly honest about this unconditional love that God has for us and for other people, if we were truly honest about that, we would say we are uncomfortable with it. Because we're used to a conditional, a transactional kind of love. That kind of love that says, you know, if you're quiet in the store, then you can. That kind of love that says, if you do this, then I won't pull my love away from you. We're used to that kind of love. And a kind of love that says, I love you, I claim you, your whole self. Be honest, that kind of love makes us a bit uncomfortable. And we don't quite trust it. We are used to another kind of love, a kind of love that is just contingent on things. If we don't act in a certain way, if we don't look a certain way, if we don't live up to standards, then either the love is withdrawn or we're at least afraid that it's going to be withdrawn. We live in a world that tells you you must do certain things in order to be lovable tells you how you should look in order to be lovable, who you must know in order to be worthy of some kind of respect, how much money you have to make to be worthy of any power in this world. And that is all conditional love. And in that kind of love, that kind of transactional love, what matters depends on where you are in that equation. Are you the one with enough or the one with less than? Are you the one who looks a certain way or the one who gets chastised for the way you dress or look? But God's love is different than that. And we are shown this kind of love in the way that Jesus interacts with people. And most specifically, let's just think about that night in which he was betrayed, the night when he is arrested and how he treats those around the table with him. He treats them with an unconditional love. He knows what Peter's going to do. Still, he eats with him, washes his feet, and goes to die for him. That's the second piece. We are claimed by a God who knows us intimately and loves us anyways. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He sees us for who we are with no filter put on it at all and still loves us. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. And still he ate with him, washed his feet, loved him, and died for him. That is the kind of love that lays claim on us. Do you remember back on Good Friday? The solemn words are spoken from the cross. It is finished. That is more than speaking about Jesus' death. What Jesus is saying there is that he, he has completed everything that is necessary for us to be claimed as his. It is finished. So Jesus looks at us just like he looked at Peter, and he sees us denying our love for Jesus when we treat others with contempt. Jesus looks at us and, like Judas, sees us when we betray him by taking his name in vain, by lying. Those things are betrayals. You can fill in the rest of the examples with the ways you struggle to carry out and be genuine in this faith that you have. This concept of being claimed by God, though, is not just sort of that theological those things we can say, it actually has an implication for your life. Right away this next week. When we understand that we are claimed by God, this is what happens. It changes how we see ourselves, and it changes how we see the world. It claims us. It means 
that we have value and worth. Being claimed means that inherent worth and value is yours. Being claimed means that you have a purpose in life. We're not just aimlessly walking around and living for the next day and the next and the next. No, God claimed you and called you and has given you a purpose. And when we are claimed, it means that we live in hope so that no matter what the challenges are that come this next week, no matter the difficulties we may face in life, we have hope in the knowledge that we belong to God and the knowledge that God works. God works always for the good of those who love him. And ultimately, God's love will prevail. There's an old song, and one of the lines in it is, even though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. So for this week, will you, along with me, please remember you are claimed by God. Will you live your life with that sense of worth and purpose and hope, knowing that the one who created everything you see, the entire universe, everything you cannot see, has claimed you? Will you go from this place with a new identity and live your days with gratitude and joy because of that? May we each live claimed. Let's pray together. I invite you to pray right now. Lift up your prayer giving thanks to God for his claim on your life. You might pray, Lord, what a relief to know I'm claimed, to know you're with me in everything, no matter what. And pray now to Jesus. Talk to Jesus about what a difference you hope that will make in your life. Almighty and gracious Lord, lay your claim on our hearts. Hold us closely and make us bold in living our lives as yours. With your Holy Spirit, seal our hearts, open our minds, and move our hands and feet as we trust in your claim for us. And together we say, Amen.
and loving God, you claim us as your very own, and in you we have our very life. Open our hearts to the needs of others. Fashion us as ones who are generous. With these offerings we have given, we signal our desire to trust in you for all our needs. With the love we receive from you, we reach out with our generosity into this world, so in need of grace, love, and peace. Make us faithful in every good thing, that trusting in you, we may show your love with grace and kindness in all that we do. This we pray because of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Can you please stand as we join together in a confession of our faith and what we believe in as we leave this place and go out into our daily lives? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. United together in hope and in the joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Gracious God, you promised to never leave us and have claimed us as your very own. Make your presence known to those who feel abandoned or alone. Bring them to the fold of loving communities. Help us to reach out to any in need. Embolden us to live with purpose and to serve as mirrors that reflect and magnify your holy love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You are the great physician and bring your healing hand to bear in ways that we may not even see. We pray for all who are sick and in need of your healing power. We pray for Henrik Jungren and Lori Cook, Joe Matlo, Lisa, and those we name before you in our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Loving God, you have given us a mirror of your love in the vocation of mothers who nurture and guide and those who raise their children in all good blessedness. We ask that you would bless those mothers when they're calling, sustain them through weary and difficult times, rejoice with those who are pregnant or are waiting to adopt. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Kind and loving Father, Console all who long to be mothers. Console children who are estranged from their mothers. Give strength to anyone grieving the death of a mother and a deep, deep solace to mothers who have lived through the death of a child. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for the family and friends of Tim Mueller and all who are grieving and know the pain of sorrow. May they be given the hope and strength through the sure and certain hope of the resurrection and through your son's victory over death and the grave. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, who teaches us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
May the God of all, who raised Jesus from the dead, bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in a new creation, knowing that you are claimed. May you be certain of God's unending love for you, generous in your words and your deeds, and renewed in all hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God.